The origin of Lollipop Chainsaw can be traced back to 2009. Inside the company restroom of Grasshopper Manufacture, where its director, Suda51, was taking a shit 51, and the image of a cheerleader wielding a chainsaw against the undead just came to him all of a sudden. That's his creative process. All of his best ideas come from taking a shit. Well, believe it or not, this ended up becoming a crowning achievement for this company. I like to refer to Lollipop Chainsaw as Suda51's $60 million plop. This is a true story. Here you go. Lollipop Chainsaw is a coming of age tale of a zombie huntress set against the backdrop of an all American town, San Romero. It sticks to the Buffy the Vampire Slayer formula in taking a ditzy popular cheerleader and pitting her against supernatural foes. Even outside of some of its more obvious B-movie influences like The Evil Dead, Lollipop Chainsaw also seemed to copy its homework from a low-budget zombie slaying video game series known as Oni Chambara. But Oni Chambara is soulless and it runs like trash. Screen tearing, no color, no life. I hate it. By 2011, Oni Chanbara had amassed over eight video games and two feature length films released by Tokyo Shock, a film production company known for over the top gore genre films such as The Machine Girl, which featured a kawaii schoolgirl dishing out gratuitous chainsaw kills. I'm willing to bet that Suda was aware of both Oni Chanbara and the films of Tokyo Shock. Also, if you consider that Grasshopper Manufacturing ended up hiring the director of Meatball Machine, Yuda Yamaguchi, a Tokyo Shock regular, to direct all the cutscenes in Lollipop Chainsaw, then it becomes quite clear that the films of Tokyo Shock were a key ingredient in this bloody cake. Likely, Suda had recognized the popularity of the subgenre of place cute girl in gore-filled situations in his home country, and maybe he believed that he could put his own spin on this formula and adapt it for Western audiences. Lollipop Chainsaw is another example of Grasshopper Manufacture trying to develop a title that would have worldwide appeal. It's another case of when East met West, only this time it didn't end in commercial failure. Lollipop Chainsaw, believe it or not, is Grasshopper Manufacturer's most financially successful game, selling over 1 million copies. I just don't get it. Shadows of the Damned had Shinji Mikami behind it. It had Akira Yamaoka, it had Suda51, all coming together to create a Resident Evil styled third person shooter from one of the creators of Resident Evil. This should have been the success, not the game about a cute cheerleader slaying zombies with a chainsaw back during the peak saturation of zombie games, but for whatever reason, it was a smash hit. I just don't understand gamers. To differentiate this project from the other zombie games on the market, he decided to create something with an upbeat and cheerful atmosphere, to contrast all the grim, dark, blood-soaked horror games that were prevalent at the time. He wanted to make an entry-level zombie game that could be enjoyed by everyone, instead of specifically catering to the hardcore audience of his past games. So Grasshopper formed a publishing deal with Kadokawa for the Japanese release, and Warner brothers for the rest of the world. The partnership with WB led to an unlikely collaboration with cult horror director James Gunn, who had previous credits for writing the Dawn of the Dead remake and one of my favorite B-movie films of all time, Slither. Now at the time, James Gunn wasn't a household name from his work on Guardians of the Galaxy, so I imagine back then it was a lot easier to request his involvement. James was sent early footage of Lollipop pop long before Juliet even had a name. 
He was then asked if he would like to write the story for the game, and James was so enamored by the concept of a cheerleader slaying the undead that he immediately signed on to adapt Suda's vision into something that could be consumed by the Western masses. Not an easy task by any stretch. Not only did Gunn take on the responsibility of writing the story and developing the characters of the game, but he enlisted actors that were regulars in his films, as well as close friends on the outside. It just so happened that James was friends with Little Jimmy Urin of mindless self-indulgence fame. Jimmy was asked to not only voice the role of Zed, the punk rock zombie, but to compose the theme songs for all the boss battles in the game under the supervision of the game's lead composer, Akira Yamaoka. Shadows of the Dam may have had an overall dream team working on it, but Lollipop Chainsaw certainly had one in the music department. Akira Yamaoka and Little Jimmy Yurin collaborating on a soundtrack? What more could you want? Well, I guess somebody at Warner Brothers wanted more because they licensed 13 music tracks that sadly overshadow the original soundtrack found within this game. Sure, you got some good stuff in there. You got your Joan Jett in the Black Hearts. You have Dragon Force. You have Skrillex, Five Finger Death Punch. Okay, you get the point. The sad part is, while some of the licensed music tracks are funny, like Tony Basil, whenever you use Juliet's star power, uh, the others just kind of detract from the great original music found within, and not only that, but I think they're the primary factor on why this game hasn't seen a release on PC or in the current gen, because the licensed tracks have to go through another negotiation phase in order for the game to be re-released. You see this shit all the time with Grand Theft Auto games. Or hell, even Alan Wake had to renegotiate all the David Bowie music in there before it could get relisted on the Xbox Live Marketplace. Sometimes the answer on why a franchise is no longer with us simply boils down to stupid corporatism. <laughs> Now before we get into the game itself, I thought I would compare both the PS3 and the 360 versions of Lollipop Chainsaw to figure out which one's the better buy. But wait, Miles, aren't you forgetting something? Didn't Lollipop Chainsaw get the Xbox One backwards compatibility treatment, much like Shadows of the Damned? No, as a matter of fact, it didn't. And to top it all off, both the 360 and the PS3 versions have now been delisted from the digital marketplace, meaning that you can't even buy it digitally anymore. You have to own the discs and the original systems. Ain't that a shame? Well, without any further ado, let's get into them. So the first thing I'm gonna be looking at is the loading time of the very first stage. How long it takes to go from the title screen to the opening level. Off on the left side, you can see what model of system I'm using, the type of drive that it contains because I did install this game on both my 360 and PS3, and the difference in loading time between the two versions was downright shocking. The 360 version only took 15 seconds to load the level. However, over on my PlayStation, PlayStation 3 Slim, using a faster 7200 RPM drive, it took 1 minute and 37 seconds to load the opening level. What is going on here? Okay, so what I did is I took the opening cutscene from both the 360 and PS3 versions and kind of mashed them together. These cutscenes are in engine, so what you get here is pretty much what you get in the main game. Now, the differences might not seem quite as obvious at first, but the further the further you get into the cutscene, you're going to start to notice some key differences here. Primarily, the PS3 version has screen tearing all over the place. Also, the 360 version seems to maintain its frame rate without issue, while the PS3 version occasionally drops frames. The 360 does sport more bloomier features, whilst the PS3 has somewhat of a deeper contrast color palette to it. It's slightly darker, and I'm not sure what the cause of that is. Unfortunately, Lollipop Chainsaw on the PS3 also shares the same issues as Shadows of the Damned with the extremely compressed audio. Listen to the 360 version. Yeah. 
And now the PS3 version. Can you hear a difference? I noticed that the PS3 version also tends to have more texture pop in than the 360, which loads things just fine. And I also noticed the 360 version has scorch marks when Juliet attacks objects. For whatever reason, those are missing on the PS3 version. Other than those things, I didn't tend to notice any severe game breaking issues. The game runs fairly well no matter what system you choose to play it on. And both versions contain that unmistakable Unreal Engine console game look with its signature piss yellow filter that made games of that generation look slightly ugly. I pick Lollipop Chainsaw on the Xbox 360 as my Lollipop Chainsaw of choice. With that said, let's get into the game. In the Attract Mode cutscene, we are introduced to our protagonist, Juliet Starling. Here we learn quite a bit about her values as a character in this short cutscene. We learn that she has a dedication to her cheerleading team, that she's immensely loyal to her family, she practices martial arts, and cares deeply for her boyfriend, Nick. To the untrained eye, she may seem like a dumb blonde punchline, but she's one of the most fearsome fighters within Grasshopper's universe. And pretty much every character that objectifies her for her body gets their comeuppance or meets the wrong end of her chainsaw. Her perpetual optimism in the face of the horror surrounding her is downright infectious and can be appreciated by just about anyone. I would challenge you to play this game without cracking a smile. We begin the game in the obscenely large parking lot area of San Romero High School, which acts as your standard tutorial level. We meet our heroine as she slays her zombified former classmates with pomp and flash. <sighs> Juliet's introduction here parallels that of Travis Touchdowns, only swapping a motorcycle for a bicycle and blood volcanoes shooting out from the enemy's heads for sparkles and rainbows. This mashup of chainsaw foo and cheerleading moves combine into an enjoyable brawler, and the move sets are simple to pull off and learn. But don't let this fool you, there is a deeper component to knowing when to use certain skills if you want to achieve mastery in the harder difficulties. Lollipop does run the gambit between casual and hardcore. The name of the game here is Sparkle Hunting. Essentially, you have to group together as many zombies as possible and deliver a decapitating blow to trigger a sparkle hunt, and the more you line up, the higher the zombie metal payout. So your focus will shift primarily to crowd control. To aid in this hunt, Juliet has a special meter over to the left, which is built up from the stars she collects on the field from fallen foes. I refer to this as Mickey time because because once it's triggered, Tony Basil's Mickey starts playing and Juliet becomes temporarily invincible and she can deliver one hit decapitations on enemies, which is super important to use in large groups to maximize your zombie metal payout. There's an economy in the game surrounding the aforementioned zombie medals. They act as a currency. Gold medals are common and platinum can only be had by sparkle hunting or from trading in your gold medals in the Chop 2 Shop kiosk found throughout the game. The in-game store offers a lot of stuff to buy, from character attribute upgrades, new movesets, music, costumes, and concept art, all of which carry over into subsequent playthroughs in a New Game Plus fashion, which incentivizes you to keep coming back to the game for more. In the level, Juliet will encounter survivors being attacked, and you will have to quickly cut through the mob to save them. And if you do, they'll part with some zombie medals and a funny one-liner for your trouble. I fucking love these. <laughs> oh my god, Easter egg. <laughs> Girls in Kenya have big butts. I 
need another tampon. Some of these survivor moments turn into annoying escort missions where a survivor will stupidly walk through several mobs of zombies and if they get killed, they'll turn into a super zombie. Swallow my fist like tuna, bitch. Super zombies are somewhat like a mid-boss encounter and they remind me a lot of the haters from Let It Die. They tend to have special movesets and a higher health bar. They block attacks more than your average zombie and deliver far more damage to Juliet. And on harder difficulties, they can give you more trouble than even the stage bosses. Thankfully, there's a way to cheese them by drop kicking them and stabbing them in the small stun window. Utilize this trick in very hard mode, trust me. When you slay a super zombie, they get added to your zombie collection. And there are unique super zombie encounters that can only be found in the harder difficulties. So once further, there's an incentive to explore all the modes the game has to offer. I should also point out horror fans, you gotta appreciate that they placed a super zombie named George right outside the gates of San Romero High School. Upon entering the gates to San Romero High, Juliet has a tragic reunion with her star-crossed boyfriend, Nick, who has been bitten by a zombie, and he's set to join the undead. And the screen fades to black. No, there's something we can try. It's the only chance we have uh, to save you. Julia? She immediately does the most sensible thing and decapitates Nick. <laughs> Stage one places us inside San Romero High School, and we come to find out Juliet was able to save Nick before the zombie venom could reach his brain. And now he's quite literally just a talking head. And this revelation doesn't go over too well with our boy Nick. Oh no. Ah, 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 Nick, ah, I had to. Oh God, oh fuck, oh God! Where's my fucking body? Over the years, Lollipop has gathered its share of critics for its sexual objectification of its barely legal protagonist, Juliet. Which, to be fair, it does do. I never thought I'd be saved by someone with such great tits. But can we also take a moment here to recognize that Nick is also objectified in the most figurative sense? Throughout the game, Juliet treats Nick like a fashion accessory and strips him of his masculinity early on. Well... What do you think? Oh man, I wish I had a penis right now. Also, the quipping head partner to the protagonist dynamic is just another carryover concept from Grasshopper's previous game, Shadows of the Damned. We got another buddy comedy on our hands. I really appreciate the design of San Romero High, from the destructible set pieces that yield zombie medals, to the little posters they put in the hallways which reference cult horror movies, like the split dog callback to Return of the Living Dead. By the way, what is it with Suda's fascination with coffee and donuts? The theme of this level seems to be explosions, as you'll encounter many dynamite strapped kamikaze zombies that will run at you and take out massive chunks of your life if you aren't careful. Nick will start to become useful when you come across a glowing blue zombie body. Juliet will attach his head to it and then cheers him on through a series of QTEs and then Nick will do something to clear the pathway. Whoa, this, whoa, this feels weird. I'm blue and stuff. A short note on the QTEs, there's a lot of them in Lollipop, but they're very generous with the button press window and never feel like a nuisance. So I'm not docking any made up points for that. You'll also get your first Nick Ticket ability. These Nick abilities are triggered by collecting tickets and none of which are particularly useful in any given situation, but amusing nonetheless. Midway through the level, another Sudaism pops its head when Juliet has to play a mandatory mini game of zombie basketball. The rules here are simple. Decap zombies and launch their heads into the basket. You need to get over 100 points to clear this game. And they put a cheeky little point guard zombie which will volley the heads back at you if you don't take them out. At the end of the level, Juliet runs into her sensei, the perverted Morikawa, who gives us a rundown on the three realms. Terry Pratchett fans will appreciate the nod of the elephants holding up the earth. Zombies are pouring in from the rotten world and it's up to the gang to figure out why? All we can do is clean up the school, kill the undead, and stop the bummer. That is our mission. 
The bomber is either in the cafeteria downstairs or the courtyard. A birthday cake loaded with dynamite candles is about to explode in the cafeteria. As an American kid that attended school during the Columbine era, the association of a bomb in the cafeteria was not lost on me. Too soon to 51 strikes again. This minigame can be rather frustrating, especially on the harder difficulties. Your goal is to keep the zombies from touching the cake and blowing up the cafeteria. And the waves get larger and the zombies get faster. My advice? Stun, run, and slash. Outside the school, you run into the primary antagonist, the hot topic goth, Swan, who is behind this outbreak. He wants to open the gate to the rotten world and genocide the human race as revenge for being bullied in school or some shit like that. This world, this government, this society made my life a hell. Well, now everyone is gonna know a life of hell. <laughs> yeah, they went with the high school shooter antagonist. I swear, if this wasn't a lighthearted zombie game with comedic intentions, one might mistake it as insensitive to the victims of the tragic American high school massacre. You know the one I'm talking about. Swan summons the Dark Purveyors, which are the game's bosses. Juliet is launched by Zed's profanity into a nearby junkyard. <laughs> Zed, played by Little Jimmy Urine, is the most perfect casting decision in the game. MSI fans will know that this man here has said every gamer word out there, and maybe he invented some. Jimmy could also be a contributing factor of why Warner Brothers might be hesitant to re-release this game in the modern generation, but then again, there's also James Kid Diddling Joke Gun, and this guy can't resist saying a good one when it comes to him. I feel kind of dizzy. Like that time Father O'Malley roofied me. All the bosses are based around a genre of music and the clothing style associated with that music. For example, Zed here's a punk rocker. The boss fights are some of the best moments this game has to offer, but that should come as no surprise to you because Grasshopper's specialty, after all, are the boss fights. Like most bosses in this game, Zed is a three-phase fight. You dodge his attacks, go in for a strike, and perform a Mad World SQTE finisher. <laughs> Wow! <laughs> you think that hurts me? I just jizzed a little! <laughs> Stage 2 takes place at the stadium, and ultimately it's just an expansion of the high school stage. The goal here is to rendezvous with Cordelia and take down the ship. You'll mostly be utilizing the new Chainsaw Dash move, which has you launching off rainbow ramps and tearing through mobs of zombies. It's a limited move, but you can refuel with these gas cans you find on the map. They really play up the chainsaw dashing courses near the end of this stage, and quite honestly, they're a good diversion. Ow! You bit my butt! Sorry. Midway through the level, Juliet sights a present from her sister floating down to the baseball field. And are those parachute colors a reference to Resident Evil's umbrella? Inside the present contains a chainsaw blaster upgrade, which introduces a third person shooting element to the game. Chainsaw Blaster! And you're given a crash course in the form of zombie baseball. This can easily be the most frustrating minigame of all, as you're tasked with protecting Nick from waves of zombies until he runs three complete laps. Word of advice, turn off the auto-aim as the game has a habit of picking the wrong zombie to shoot, and this game can go south real quick if you aren't on top of killing the zombies. Aim for the heads, refill your ammo, and just pray. Most most likely, you'll die your first time through. Home run! Yeah! Come on, Jeff! I rule! Well, the game's over. Guess that bomb's gonna go off. While you're blown into a million fucking pieces, think we'll wrap things up in the booth. See ya! The end of this level has you facing off against Vikey, the black metal Viking, voiced by Michael Rooker, a regular cast member of Gunn's movies, and he was also Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Side note, both Michael Rooker and Jimmy Urine share a scene together in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, during Yondu's Massacre. The Vikey fight has you dodging lightning bolts and body slams. At one point, Vikey hides in the crow's nest and launches zombies at you until 
until you shoot down his barrier. Phase 2 has you fighting his torso and legs, just attack the torso. And Phase 3 throws Vikey's giant head at you as it pinballs across the ship. Wait for it to stop, then move in for a strike. Your Viking brains are good for the complexion. Stage 3 places Juliet at the O'Bannon farm, which once again is a reference to Dan O'Bannon, the writer and director of Return of the Living Dead. Hell yes. Juliet runs into her younger sister, Rosalind, who's driving a school bus erratically throughout the farm. This stage introduces fat zombies and more flying zombies. It places you in a few third person shooting segments where you must protect Rosalind's bus from zombies and boulders. One thing to note, there's a really good spot to sparkle hunt about three quarters of the way through this level where they throw a massive horde of zombies at you. Strangely enough, this is a rare occurrence in the game. So make sure you save up your Mickey time for it. There are also these magic mushrooms to cut down, which induces these hallucinations where you're facing off against giant zombie chickens. I really believe Suda could have come up with more creative trippy moments than what we are given here. Juliet will eventually wake up in a wheat thresher where she's tasked with taking out all these zombies. It's not terribly challenging, and I believe these segments may just be another nod to the mundane grass mowing part-time jobs found in No More Heroes. The stage boss here is the psychedelic hippie zombie, Mariska. She's my least favorite fight in the game, as it's not all that challenging and it's chainsaw blaster focused. You just shoot the bubbles, dodge the junk she throws at you, and move in for a strike. The trippy skyboxes during this fight are cool though. <laughs> Such a fight. The lead up to the stage four introduces the best character in the game, Gideon, the patriarch of the Starling clan. He's not entirely opposed to Nick and Juliet's unconventional relationship, but he certainly has some fair questions for the duo. But whatever dude Juliet ends up with is gonna be part of the family business. What are you gonna do? Throw magic stars at chupacabras with your tongue? Maybe, Dad. Nick's tongue is very limber. And how do you know that? She doesn't. She doesn't know that at all, sir. He gives our heroes a ride to the Fulci Fun Center, a massive arcade named after Lucio Fulci, the Italian director of the zombie series. Did you even know that? This is by far the most creative level that the game provides, as Juliet has to play through several retro game inspired levels to make it to the top of the tower. The first game places her in a life-size version of Pac-Man, where she has to dodge these giant fez-wearing ghosts and collect eight keys to escape. Juliet, can I ask you something sort of sensitive? Oh, yes, Nick? My face is stuck in your butt. Can you move it a little? Oh. Game two is an homage to elevator action. Juliet rides elevators, opens doors, and slays vector graphic-styled zombies to get her to the top. If it bleeds, I can kill it. The third game is a short scuffle with more vector zombies in the middle of a life-size game of Pong. Cool enough, I suppose. And the fourth and final throwback game is based upon Crazy Climber, which the reference may be lost on Western gamers here. This was an arcade favorite in Japan and known for its punishing difficulty. And here it's no different. Juliet has to get her block up to the top of the screen without being hit by any of the projectiles dropped upon her. And she cannot land on an open window panel, otherwise she'll die. I did not realize there was an option to shoot, probably because there was no tutorial to clue you in on this fact. So I died. A lot. By the way, there's an achievement for making it to the top without shooting, but good luck on that, they do not make it easy on you. 
At the top of the Fulci Fun Center is the spaceship leading to the stage boss. Josie is our funky boss, and it's honestly my favorite fight in the entire game. Sadly, this is only a two-phase boss fight. Phase one, Josie flies around on his UFO and drops pixelized bombs on the stage. If he catches you during a dash attack, you have to play a quick game of Simon to dodge his attack. <laughs> Just shoot him a bunch and you'll be fine. Phase two puts you on top of a huge spaceship barreling at the speed of light. You have to take out all these conduits to destroy Josie's barrier. And you're rewarded with one of the best lines of betrayal at the end. Hey, you promised you'd give her back if we won. <laughs> you just did what I said. <laughs> I'm a mother freaking zombie. Stage 5, the cathedral, is where the game starts to wind down. In the intro here, we have the zombie hunting family coming together to draw up a blueprint to infiltrate the cathedral. It's a heartwarming moment juxtaposed by Nick's existential crisis about being a decapitated head for the rest of his days. Check it out! I gave it a makeover! I am not an it. Son, if you don't quit acting like a fruit, I'm gonna stick you in the juicer. Juliet is kind of a dick to him when he expresses his valid concerns of his shitty situation. And the power dynamic in this relationship is truly illustrated for us. See, Nick? It's not so bad, huh? You took away my choice, Juliet. You're making me no better than those zombies. There's not much to point out about this level. You just kind of fight your way through a rogue gallery of enemies you've already faced before. And at one point, Rosalind shows up with a wrecking ball, which you then have to dodge as she smashes through the horde. Gideon activates a Rube Goldberg machine and opens up the pit to the stage boss, who's Lewis, the final of the Dark Purveyors. Looks like we can make beautiful death together. Phase 1 has Lewis riding his motorcycle around the perimeter, and he'll occasionally charge you, which is your cue to strike. Phase 2 has Lewis merge with his bike into a motorized mastodon. This phase has a lot of health bars to take out, as each of the individual limbs must be removed before you can proceed to the next phase. There's a small window to hit him, and Lewis will often get off cheap shots on you. The final phase is pretty much more the same, only Lewis will start firing grenades at you as he retreats off into the background. You have got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> At the end of the level, Swan comes out and gives you his backstory. And then he Kurt Cobains himself to bring his plan to fruition. He opens the gates of the rotten world, summoning forth the zombie of zombies, Killa Billy, who's one half Stay Puft Marshmallow Man and one half Elvis Presley. Which brings us to the final stage. Stage 6, which goes by WTF, is a mad dash down the streets of San Romero as Killabilly throws cars and shoots lasers at Juliet. It's not necessarily a fully fledged level, and nothing of note happens until the fight. You just chainsaw dash and attack mobs of zombies. Up until Killabilly snatches up Juliet, and she has to stab his hands to get a vantage point to shoot out his laser eyes. Phase 2 throws you on a building as Killabilly takes swipes at you and throws zombies and cars your way. Oddly enough, it reminds me quite a bit of Deadly Premonition's final boss fight, and fans of that game will know what I'm referring to. The objective here is to give Killabilly a deep manicure with your chainsaw. I do appreciate the moments when he jumps into the background to do his windmill air guitar like Elvis. The fight isn't particularly difficult, but it does end with a bang when Gideon drives his motorcycle loaded to the teeth with dynamite into Killabilly's face and blows a nasty hole. Thus begets an emotional scene with Juliet. Morikawa Sensei calls her from heaven on her chainsaw phone to let her know that she must activate Nick's final ability, the Nick Bomb, to end Killabilly and the zombie outbreak once and for all. It's quite the tender moment shared between the two, and not too dissimilar from the tone set in the finale of Shadows of the Damned. But remember, Suda's aiming for smiles here, so we're gonna end things on a happy note. Nick! 
Juliet. The mix-up. I've got Morikawa's body. See Happy End. Also, Gideon somehow survives to deliver the funniest line in the game. Daddy, don't you think you should go to the hospital? Not necessary. I use a staple gun up there to put the old stroke back together again. I'm a new man! In conclusion, I will say Lollipop Chainsaw has a lot of character and some solid laughs throughout. Although the game is not Suda at its most creative, and it certainly lacks his signature surreal storytelling, I feel he hit his intended mark here. Sure, the concept of a zombie killing heroin has been played out time and time again, but never in this cheerful spirit. Suda's plan to adapt this format for a Western audience paid off, and I believe the success was well earned. Out of all of Suda's games, it has the best pacing. It's a quick run that you can play through in an afternoon, and it never feels boring or overstays its welcome. It has focus, which grasshopper games tend to lose somewhere along the way when creative liberties are taken to the extreme, often at the expense of alienating the player. 25th Ward players will know what I'm talking about. In many ways, the restraints placed upon Suda, either from WB or James Gunn's script, kept Suda on track. As a benefit or consequence of this simple game design, LC stands as my go-to Suda game recommendation that I could recommend to just about anyone. Its appeal is easy for the layman to understand, and even if you don't enjoy the game itself, its stellar soundtrack might win you over in the end. Sadly, we're eight years out and there's still no sequel. To my shock, I found in the art of Grasshopper Manufacture that Suda stated that there was an initial plan plan to make this a three game franchise but for whatever reason, that never came to be. The last official appearance of Juliet Starling was back in 2013. Juliet made a silent cameo in Killer is Dead's Smooth Operator DLC. Then she vanished up until 2019, where it was speculated that she made a cameo in Travis Strikes Again. But let me squash that rumor right here and now. In TSA, Travis Touchdown encounters a secretary slash pro PC gamer named Juliet. All we know is she's pretty good at Unreal Tournament, and back in 2008, her and Travis competed against each other at a professional gaming tournament. Now people have speculated this is Juliet Starling based only on her name and because Travis remarks that she smells of blood, to which Juliet replies that she left the past behind her when she left home. That's it. I'm marking this down as a coincidence and not some subtle way to include Juliet in TSA without paying WB royalties. The only conclusion that I can draw from the limited information on the topic is that Suda wants to make another one, but it's not his decision decision to make, as GHM do not own the rights to the IP. But at the same time, we also like listening to fan voices, which we've mentioned before, and the loudest voices that we hear are generally for Lollipop Chainsaw. That's something that we seem to hear a lot of people wanting to see more of. Um, whether or not that is uh, the old, the original game being released on a new platform, or whether it is a sequel, that's something that a lot of people seem to want and we think would be kind of cool to do. Yeah, I would like to make a new one, but it would be a really hard thing to do. First of all, the IP is you know, owned uh, collaboration with Warner and Kadokawa, so obviously I would have to get their OKs before I did anything like that. But yeah, if I could work again with James and do a collaboration and create a new Lollipop Chainsaw, I think that would be a lot of fun. There is some good news here as Suda and James Gunn still keep in touch through email. I'm not about to make any wild predictions here, but back when the game first launched, James Gunn did say he'd be down to make more video games. So do you think that this would be something you want to do it more in the future? Absolutely, I'd love to do it. I'd do it tomorrow if they asked me. So if, if we could come up with a cool, as long as it's like a cool concept that's fun, you know, I'm into it. Hi, my name is Hikiko. I run, write, and edit all the videos you see on Hikiko Mori Media. So if you liked what you saw today, please consider subscribing and watching these other Grasshopper Manufacturer videos that I wrote and edited myself. And hey, 
If you're a video editor out there for a big company, just don't download my video and pretend like you own it and take all my edits and all my hard work. I know you like to do that for every one of my fucking grasshopper videos. Just don't do that. Also, if you want to reach out to me, I'm easily available on Twitter. You can just DM me if you'd like. You can leave me a comment down below. Really easy to do. Really easy to do. But unfortunately, I had to resort to using this watermark throughout the video. Not this one, this one. That's right, I did that. I did that because of you. Be better. Play your own games. See y'all next time.